Hi, this is a video about the history of baptism and the way that the theology of baptism developed in the early church and up into the Reformation, our usual historical sweep. Um, we're starting with the earliest Christian understandings, and then we're touching down in the Reformation because um, it was the Reformation, because it was such a moment of crystallizing um, influences in, in our theology. So. Um, we talked a little bit about this in the Tuesday night class, I think, and possibly even in the Sunday forum. But just to say, in the New Testament, you can see that baptism was a really important thing, right? We have John the Baptist, and we have Jesus's reference. Well, Jesus himself is baptized. We have Jesus making reference to baptism um, in lots of different ways, and we hear about it a lot in the epistles. In the Gospels, it seems like baptism is about forgiveness of sins and repentance, even though Jesus gets baptized without having a reason to repent. It also seems like baptism in the Gospels is an action that you undertake in order to um, give a sign of the conversion of your life, right? That you kind of wash free of all of your past sin. We hear about phrases like being baptized with water and the spirit in the gospels. We don't absolutely have a perfect sort of theological um, dictionary that tells us exactly what it means to be baptized with fire or baptized with the spirit. Those are the source of a lot of reflection for, for us all reading the scriptures. In Acts of the Apostles, now remember that the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles are kind of one continuous um, narrative. In Acts, it's sort of the normal expectation that you would get baptized and the Holy Spirit would um, come over you. So we can see that that was the practice of uh, something like that was the practice of the early church. But then there are examples in Acts of the Apostles of people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they seek baptism, right? So, um, or even people who've been baptized, but they have no idea what this Holy Spirit thing is, right? So you can see that in the early church, there wasn't um, a kind of, it's not like they sat down and formed a committee and articulated what their theology of baptism was and exactly how the liturgical practices were going to correspond to that theological um, understanding. On the contrary, the New Testament records the tumult and the um, creative chaos of a community um, relatively newly under the sway of Jesus, not consolidated into a big um, formalized church yet. And you see them doing a range of things in relation to baptism. Again, that baptism is a baptism of repentance in the kind of John the Baptist mode, that there's something else called baptism with the spirit, baptism with fire, um, uh, and that there is a connection between the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that in the um, in Acts of the Apostles in particular gets uh, associated with um, prophesying and being filled with joy, right? Um, that's related to baptism, but it's not always a causal relationship. Sometimes the Holy Spirit causes baptism, it seems. Sometimes baptism causes um, a, a life in the Holy Spirit or the coming of the Holy Spirit. And it seems like they're open to saying a range of things about, about um, what that means, about what baptism is and who the Holy Spirit is. Gradually, you've heard this story before and you'll hear it again. Gradually, baptism and the other sacraments get more formalized in the first couple of centuries of Christianity as the church gets larger and more powerful. Um, just as we heard last week that the canon of scripture got consolidated over the first couple of centuries of Christianity, so too did sacramental practices and the understanding of baptism. And as was true with the scriptures, so is true with the sacraments. Um, the early Christian church worked out its understanding of baptism, partly in relationship to what we call Gnosticism, a set of understandings that were um, ultimately rejected, it took a long time by Christianity, not entirely rejected, but um, officially in Western Christianity rejected. Um, Gnostics 
um, there were Gnostics who wanted to avoid sacramental action altogether because it seemed like God was purely spirit. And so it's important to remember that our sacramental life represents um, a conscious determination that Christianity remain um, a thing of the earth as well as of that spirit. And so we, you know, we get water on ours. We, we touch water to bless the water. We receive the host in our hands. We eat the bread. We drink the wine. Um, there is also, um, there were also Gnostics who wanted more elaborate and um, more elaborate in initiation rituals and something that we would think of as more like a secret society. As we talk about what baptism was in the early church, you'll see that it feels a bit like a secret society anyway, but, um, but that, that too was um, a, a working out that avoided what the real extremes were in that time of, um, of being separated from the world by baptism. The church developed gradually an incarnational understanding of the sacraments that they are both spiritual and material. So again, our sacramental life is founded in the incarnation, in the fact that Jesus is God and Jesus is human and Jesus is with us. We have descriptions of the process of becoming a member of the church from the third century, and it involves um, an institution that we call the catechumenate or the, the, um, the, the, the process of initiating a catechumen. Th those are people who are coming to be baptized, right? Um, you guys who are in this confirmation class and preparing for baptism and confirmation and reception could be understood as catechumens, right? People who are seeking um, a sacramental life with Jesus, a deepened sacramental life with Jesus. In, in the early centuries of the church, especially when the church was um, subject to persecution, but even after when the church was subject to power, in both cases, it was really necessary to um, spend a lot of time becoming a Christian. It wasn't the sort of thing, you know, we're going through a process and I know you guys are working hard, but um, just be glad, <laughs> be glad this is not the third century. Um, in the third century, you would come to church to be baptized and you and your baptismal sponsor would have to undergo a lot of questioning about your lifestyle, right? So um, did you run a brothel? Did you work in a theater, which was a scandalous, notorious profession and also could be associated with prostitution? Were you monogamous? What kind of involvement in paganism had you had? And if you were accepted after undergoing that questioning and they, they could determine that you um, had essentially purified yourself, that you had made a conversion of life. If you were accepted, you would then undergo three years of formation. So again, you guys are getting off easy here with this um, 10 or 12 week series. Uh, after that time of three years of preparation, um, the catechumens would be examined for evidence of holiness of life. And then they would undergo a ritual bathing and a fasting and would keep a vigil of prayer before Easter. By the fourth century, there was less personal scrutiny and there was more emphasis on um, what are your motives? Are you trying to get in with the in crowd here by, by being baptized? Were you really Christian or were you trying to get in good with the government, right? This is after um, the emperor Constantine has made Christianity into the official state religion. Were your beliefs orthodox? Um, as the custom of observing Lent became more prominent, Lent in particular became a period of spiritual preparation. And um, one contemporary, one contemporary writer um, has this beautiful phrase that I think is still really applicable to um, the way we think about Lent. This, this 20th century writer says that um, Lent is a period of rehab or the catechumenate is a period of rehab for people who are addicted to the world. And that um, this process of preparing for your solemn reception or confirmation or indeed baptism is a period of learning to let go 
to an addiction to the way the world thinks, the way the world competes, the way the world um, lacks depth of commitment to other people, right? the way we're taught to lack depth of commitment, um, the way the world teaches us to exploit the resources that we're given. Um, this is a time of rehab. In the early church, again, by the fourth century, baptism took place at the Easter vigil, as we still um, like it to do in our contemporary practice. It was a really elaborate ritual. It involved um, full immersion, um, naked, and then being clothed in a white robe to symbolize purity and rebirth. And also chrismation, the anointing with oil, to seal the newly baptized as God's own. Um, that sealing was like what you think of when you seal a letter with sealing wax, right? There's, a, there's an emphasis on the integrity of your life in God and the sort of self-containment of it. Not because we aren't connected to one another, but because um, you become yourself in your baptism, Right? And there's a seal put on your forehead that says, um, this, you're God's letter to the world. You are God's document. You are God's own. In the fourth century, in, under a wave of persecution um, by the Roman emperor, some Christians denied their faith in order to escape persecution and in order to survive. An understandable thing to do, isn't it? Um, but it led to a lot of questions afterwards. What do you do with these people who are baptized, but who denied their faith and made sacrifice to the emperor um, after they had been baptized and under persecution? Some people died as martyrs and others didn't. And the ones who didn't um, called into question um, whether they were still baptized, right? If you, if you offer a sacrifice of incense to a, a pagan god, right? Are you still a baptized Christians? Could you say that, they, that those people had really been baptized? Had they really experienced full conversion of life? Had the Holy Spirit really filled them, right? Was that real? Um, what would you say about a priest who had turned his back on his vows and had been willing to offer um, worship to the emperor. Um, could you say that that priest now could return to the church and administer a valid sacrament? Could that priest come back and baptize someone else? Right? Um, what's the condition of these people once they have marked themselves as somehow not God's own, right? Um, There, St. Augustine is one of the theologians who's really associated with refuting the idea that, um, that an impure minister renders a sacrament invalid. Augustine says that, um, that a sacrament has its own validity and it's under this pressure, under the pressure of really the disobedience of Christians and priests in particular, that the church needed to, um, say again what it was that a sacrament was. And it turns out that in our way of believing, the purity of the minister officiating is not the be all and the end all of the validity of the sacrament. The sacrament has its own validity. So when you see people who don't wanna take communion from a particular priest or don't wanna be confirmed by a particular bishop or don't want to have that bishop come and visit their parish, either because that bishop is too liberal or is too conservative or is a woman or um, has ordained women or has ordained gay people. Um, all of those are examples of things that happen in the contemporary church. That is an ancient Christian feud, um, not because ordaining women is a sinful thing. Obviously, I don't think that, but because even if you do think that's a sin, you don't understand what a sacrament is if you think the holiness of the person doing the administering is the make or break um, concern for you. And so 
we don't rebaptize. We don't say you were baptized by this priest, but that priest turned out to be sort of a heretic. So we're not going to accept that baptism anymore. We don't rebaptize people who were baptized as adults. Um, people who were baptized in a, in a denomination in which you had to be able to make an adult um, proclamation of faith. We don't rebaptize. We rebaptize if you have not been baptized in a Trinitarian formulation in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so if your baptism is um, not doctrinally um, Trinitarian, we will rebaptize you. But that, that's the only um, circumstance in which we'll do that. You'll remember we have the understanding that grace is an outward and visible, I'm sorry, that the sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward grace. We say that um, that means even that the minister who's performing the act is not the grace, right? <laughs> is not to be confused with the grace. And though it is by the grace of God that as a priest, um, you, you enter into the sacrament and you pray and you administer the sacraments and you uh, strive to live a holy life, your success or failure at that is not what makes the sacrament valid. The emphasis is on the church, on the belief of the church, the faith of the church. The emphasis is on the action of God in the church. God did this. And no matter how we screwed it up, we're not gonna, we're not gonna call that invalid, right? Um, I am now again leaping forward from the fourth century to the 16th century to the Reformation. In, um, in England and really throughout Europe. Um, in the Reformation, again, questions come up about the nature of sacraments. And there is more emphasis in the um, growing Protestant um, theology. There's much more emphasis on um, the inward faith as opposed to the outward action. I guess ideally we could say that in Catholic theology, um, the in the faith of the people participating in the sacraments, both the person being baptized and the person baptizing, or the person receiving communion and the person administering communion, both of those are caught up in the grace of God. Um, the grace of God is active in the life of the church in a way that doesn't depend on those two people being all filled up and pumped up with the Holy Spirit at the moment that the that communion is administered or baptism is administered. We say that the Holy Spirit is active in the life of the church by the grace of God and not by my um, uh, correctness as a believer or it, indeed as a priest. Um, the Protestant Reformation, quite understandably, focused on the possibilities for insincerity and corruption and sort of um, spiritual deadness that can come with an approach like that, right? That says, oh, it doesn't matter. I mean, we can be familiar with this in our own form of worship, right? To tell ourselves over and over again, oh, it's the grace of God and it doesn't matter whether I'm feeling what happens in communion or not. Okay, right? That's true that communion is still valid. But if your life with God lacks passion, right? For a long, long time, you wanna look at that, right? That's something, to, um, that's something to explore and to examine, not in a legalistic way because your sacraments aren't valid, but because you may be missing something, right? In your relationship with God, in the fullness of God's grace in your life. So the faith of the participants becomes a more important consideration in the Protestant Reformation. Uh, they reject infant baptism, as you know, because a, an infant can't assent to baptism. Um, and Anabaptists, right, are people who will actually re-baptize people who had been baptized as infants. They, they will not baptize infants because they can't assent. And if you were baptized as an infant, you're not baptized in, in that way of understanding. Um, I think I'm going to leave it at that, uh, just to say that um, it was by the history of baptizing and working out what happened afterwards that the church, by the grace of God, developed this theology of the sacraments in which um, 
the sacraments have their own efficacy. Again, because the Holy Spirit fills the church. And we have to receive that theology wisely, right? A foolish way to receive that theology is to say, as long as I go through the motions, it doesn't matter what else happens. And I'm going to become an intensely, um, you know, you can become sort of ritually obsessive. I know in our community, that seems like it's a good thing, but it's, it's not, um, not at the expense of a, a lively faith, right? Um, and we do have to be on the alert all the time for the idea that going through the motions is a substitute for um, our inner faith. At the same time, we don't wanna put the emphasis just on our faith because this is not something that I do as a faith-filled person or that the church does to me as a faith-filled institution, God does it, right? And, um, and for that understanding, the sacramental life of the church is, um, is a great support and a great sign. No matter how beautiful a theology might be, no matter how beautiful a set of practices might be, if we carry them badly, we call them into ill repute. And I, I kind of think that's what happened in the Protestant Reformation to the Catholic sacraments. I think that they were carried badly. I think that um, the spiritual dryness, the, um, the legalism, the arrogance of the clergy, the, the intensity of the hierarchy and the arrogance of the hierarchy uh, and the flat out corruption, right? Uh, made the church's language almost impossible to hear, made the language of the sacraments almost impossible to hear. They're still valid, they're still efficacious, but they are not communicating, right? They're not, um, uh, they're called into ill repute. And so we at St. Mark's who um, inherit such a rich sacramental tradition and such a beautiful um, practice of baptism, we need to work extra hard to make sure that that's not about vestments or about the beauty of the font. We need to work extra hard to have a lively faith so that the pretty stuff becomes a decoration or it becomes an expression of what's happening in us and not a substitute for it, not a substitute for that. Um, in that sense, we are Catholic and reformed in the Anglo-Catholic tradition. We we carry the Catholic tradition, and at the same time, we carry the Reformation insistence that our hearts be involved in this, right? Um, I'm eager to talk to you and to hear questions and to, um, to continue to work on all of these questions, but that's a, that's a brief uh, survey of the history of baptism, the theology of baptism, and uh, where we are now. <laughs>